So uh, for, the, for those of you who, who have been to a few of these events, I, 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 I think uh, you might have noticed, generally, uh, other than like opening remarks and some closing remarks, I try to stay off stage uh, and stay in the background and let other people do all the work. Um, but I, I, for this panel, I just couldn't resist actually <laughs> uh, being on the panel. Um, so back in uh, 2002, uh, right after 9-11, um, uh, a set of us decided we needed to sort of rethink sort of climate politics and policy. Um, and, uh, you know, what was interesting, we, um, uh, we started this thing called the Apollo Project. And the thing that was interesting about Apollo is that um, if you look at all, pretty much just about everyone who started it, uh, we were all kind of environmental outsiders. Like, like really, like none of the kind of principles involved in this thing came out of the sort of mainstream environmental movement. Uh, mostly uh, came from labor, other sort of um, uh, precincts of progressive politics. Um, and you know, the, the idea was to sort of shift climate policy and framing from sort of an, a, a central, an I, a politics and a idea about climate change and about dealing with climate change that was centrally focused on the environment. Um, and frankly, often sort of pre-apocalyptic view of the problem uh, to one that sort of offered just a, a, a kind of more immediate and compelling vision for the future of the economy uh, and also energy security. Um, and like a bunch of that stuff sort of seems really, really kind of common sense, conventional wisdom today. But I think unless you were kind of really around uh, climate and environmental politics at the time, I think it's really hard to appreciate what a kind of radical uh, um, and, and, and frankly, in, in a lot of circles, quite controversial uh, move that was. Um, uh, for those of you who are familiar with the essay, Death of Environmentalism, which I uh, co-authored, you know, it was really in part inspired by sort of some frustration with kind of how slow the environmental community was to sort of pick up on that idea. And it really took like five, six years to get to the point where like this was how envir you know, environmentalists actually talk about, talked about solving climate change. Um, and in fact, you know, by the time uh, we got to sort of 2007, 2008, it was kind of mainstream, at least sort of the political framing uh, among Democrats um, and, um, uh, uh, and also much of the environmental community. Um, and the idea behind Apollo was a 300, it seems, it seems kind of, you know, now that like Bernie Sanders wants to spend $16 trillion, uh, like it, this sounds kind of like, like really kind of quaint, but um, it was uh, uh, $300 billion in clean energy and clean energy sort of infrastructure over 10 years. Um, and this was like the big, uh, this was the big idea. Um, and, and really, actually, and, and you know, uh, he'll talk more about his, I'm going to let everyone introduce themselves instead of introducing them, uh, but you know, Bracken, uh, who sort of did uh, a lot of the early policy development around that. And really, if you kind of go back and then look at like Obama's green stimulus, uh, you know, we wanted 300 billion. I think we got, depending on what exactly you count, maybe 150 to 200 billion more like over five years. Um, but really, it kind of was pretty much that, like when Bracken sat down in like 2002 and was like, here's the 10-point plan for all the things that like we should spend this money on, like you go look at the green stimulus, you know, six, seven years later, and there it is. So kind of also a pretty interesting idea, you know, uh, around how actually kind of ideas um, and sort of intellectual work actually over the long term can have a huge impact uh, you know, not just on politics, but actually uh, in the world. Um, so uh, that was what Apollo was, which is really what I want to explain, because I assume there were people here who probably weren't familiar with some of this history. But really what we want to talk about today is kind of like, what did we learn from that? As there's lots of talk of a kind of Green New Deal that has sort of picked up and built on a bunch of those ideas, what can we learn? Uh, what should we, like, what might uh, sort of Green New Deal proponents kind of not want to do? <laughs> what were some of the mistakes or what are some of the pitfalls? Um, so uh, what I'd like to do is actually um, ask um, uh, each of our panelists to sort of introduce themselves. And I want to, you know, not, uh, what I'd like you to do is take a little bit more time to kind of say, first of all, like, what were you doing when you came and started doing the Apollo work? Because I think it really is so interesting where the folks who kind of started that thing came from and where they didn't come from. 
Um, uh, what was your involvement uh, with Apollo? Kind of what did you do? How did this sort of shape your kind of personal and professional trajectory? Uh, and then what are you doing now? Because you're all doing really interesting things and sort of still in the fight in really interesting ways. So um, Kate, start, or why don't we start down with there Dan? Because Good. chronologically, it makes more sense yeah. to start down there. Um, <laughs> thanks. So uh, Dan Carroll, um, at the time, uh, you know, just around 9-11, I was probably, I was like two decades in, had been energy and environmental policy nerd and a presidential management fellow, but had segued into presidential politics, advocacy pol politics, and was running a uh, sort of a pre-indivisible uh, anti-George Bush uh, progressive service center, if you will. Um, Apollo for me started morning of 9-11, um, realizing first shock, uh, then smart, realizing that the rental car I had was probably the best way to take a 15 hour drive to get home. Um, so commandeered it and, you know, while driving, just started thinking about, you know, uh, many things, including on 9-14, uh, my company was going to launch a big sensible priorities, let's move money from defense to social and economic investment for uh, Ben Cohen, Bernie Sanders, and a bunch of folks. I'm thinking, you know, this dog's probably not going to hunt very well, and there's going to be a wave of patriotism, et cetera. And so wrote a moonshot memo around the Apollo idea, shopped it with a bunch of people. A lot of famous people said no. Uh, Bob Borisage and Joel Rogers, among others, um, said yes. Uh, happened to meet Bracken at a dinner, not unlike this, and thought, this guy, he knows labor, which is critical. I'm sure we'll get into that. So that was the Apollo uh, origin story for me. And then in terms of what I'm up to now, I mean, I'm basically in the deployment uh, business. So I was working for Jerry Brown. I'm at the Milken Institute. But for the last, um, you know, eight, ten years or so. I worked on the Obama campaign in a senior role and did their new energy uh, plan rollout. Um, you know, asked me later about Copenhagen and what we could have gotten in 2010, uh, as I think part of advice maybe for the Green New Dealers about sometimes the perfect is the enemy of the really good. Um, but then I work on community economic development, public private partnerships, resilient infrastructure, and get into the weeds of. Um, how do we implement uh, national legislation, but actually much closer to ground, so. Great. <clears throat> and uh, I'm Bracken Hendricks. I was the executive director of the Apollo Alliance when we first uh, started. And as Dan said, was part of the kind of the founding team that pulled together this coalition. Um, I had been working, uh, I'm an urban planner by training, which I think is a common thread for all of us, and it's actually not accidental, this sort of starting on the ground in a place-based way and thinking about how policy and economic structures uh, and, and sort of jobs and economic growth come together in places is something that I think has informed all of our thinking fairly deeply. Um, I'd been working uh, with the Vice President's Office under Vice President Gore, um, and when there was no Gore administration, uh, landed with a think tank that was affiliated with the AFL-CIO looking at economic development on the ground. Um, and I was really coming uh, directly in contact with the rift between labor and environment, between jobs and stewardship. And it seemed like uh, what the work we were doing was looking at sectoral economic development strategy. How do you build an industry? How do you build a trade? How do you create jobs, certification, career ladders? And it seemed to me that green was just another sector. Uh, and so I had written a similar but different memo from Dan's memo and was kicking it around the labor movement saying, you know, this really should be job for iron workers or for chemical uh, refinery workers or for service employees in the management of buildings. Um, and then Dan came uh, and we sort of had this sort of realization that we were pushing in a similar direction um, around national security, around economic development, and around the stimulus, which the, the Bush administration had had a stimulus that hadn't gone far enough, um, and that seen properly climate solutions and the greening of the economy. We wore the same clothes. Was, exactly, we wear the same outfits, so it's all good. Um, so, so, so that led to creating 
uh, sort of this, this thing that became the Apollo Alliance um, and the, the relationship to Bob Borisage, who was very nationally focused on progressive politics, and Joel Rogers, who was very much involved in how do you do state-based and local strategies, uh, was really important. So it was very much about making connection across labor and environment, uh, across um, community-based growth versus federal policy. And like somewhere in the middle, we've actually got to rebuild this economy. Um, so it was a, a, a really good effort, and I think we, we were highly successful at changing the debate. Um, I think it raised a lot of questions about how you turn uh, rhetoric and political strategy and narrative into a pathway for action. Um, and I think we're all still wrestling with that in, in different ways today. Uh, subsequent to stepping away from Apollo Alliance, um, I worked with Governor Inslee and uh, we wrote a book together um, called Apollo's Fire. Um, and most recently, I just came off of uh, building that 218-page plan for how to retool the economy mm -hmm. uh, with Governor Inslee, which was a, a real joy. He's a, a, a magnificent person. Um, I also went and uh, worked with John Podesta to help start the energy program at the Center for American Progress, um, and, subs and did a lot of work also with President Clinton at uh, the Clinton Global Initiative on jobs and infrastructure. From that, I've gotten very interested in capital markets, and I now have a company called uh, Urban Ingenuity, and we're building solar for affordable housing and microgrids for universities, and a number of, we're like just trying to actually get it done. So somewhere in that space of how do you make policy and how do you do the work is sort of where I live. That's great. Um, hi, I, I'm Kate <laughs> Gordon, and I came a little bit later than these two to Apollo. I, I showed up around 2004. Um, I had been, I'm also a planner and a lawyer by training, and I had been, uh, before I went to law school and planning school after college, I'd been a tenant organizer for a number of years and done sort of basic Saul Linsky organizing theory and a lot of work in the Tenderloin in San Francisco, at that time organizing uh, single resident occupancy hotels that had a lot of people in them who were on the tail, at the, the transition into AZT cocktail, and so a lot of people with sort of at the end of that horrible transition of HIV AIDS. Uh, so very, very intense experience um, doing that and went to law school and planning school really to sort of do work that was more about the structural economic reasons that had led to a lot of the conditions that people were living in. Um, and uh, ended up coming out of law school to do a lot of work as a lawyer. I was doing impact litigation with a public interest firm um, now called Public Justice. It was called Trial Lawyers for Public Justice at the time. Um, like fighting mandatory arbitration policies and doing sort of economic policy. And I was realizing while I was there that I really wanted, again, to be kind of working on these more structural issues that were at the intersection, not on like one little piece, but at the intersection of a number of the different pieces coming together. And I also wanted to get my organizing, you know, go back to doing a little bit more organizing. So I called up my old friend, Joel Rogers, and I said, who I've known since I was 13, long story, um, and I said, Joel, what are you up to? What's going on, et cetera, et cetera, on Wisconsin strategy or cows um, at University of Wisconsin. And he told me about a project that he was just starting with these guys. They had just sort of ramped it up. They'd done the first set of studies um, on really looking at that intersection of economic workforce development and the sort of emerging clean energy economy. And particularly, I think this is one of the important things about Apollo and just about the space we're in generally is that that energy and climate are very local issues in some ways, global and local. And at the time, a big driver of Apollo was domestic energy, was not importing um, energy from other places. We were at the time importing liquid, liquefied natural gas. We were importing a lot of oil. Um, those arguments are not the same as they were <laughs> when we started <laughs> Apollo. But so Joel basically said, I need somebody to come and help me figure out the state and local piece of this new project. And I said, literally, I have no idea what you're talking about. I've never worked on energy policy in my entire life. And he said, you know, it's essentially workforce and economic policy with a bunch of organizing thrown in. And I was like, all right. <laughs> so um, went to Wisconsin. And it really was that I, I was running the, um, the, so Bracken was the head of the, was the executive director. I was running the state and local piece, which we called the Apollo Strategy Center. And we really provided policy guidance and communications guidance and organizing support to nodes all over the country. We created Apollo chapters all over the place that were each slightly different from each other, which I think is another important thing about Apollo, is that you know, in 
California, the IBEW building trades were a huge piece of Apollo, but they were not a huge piece of Apollo in other places where the steel workers were a bigger piece. Or you had you know, a goal of renewable energy portfolio standard in one place, but in another place it was fuel, and in another place it was building codes. Like just was very, very locally driven. So we provided um, centralized support, policy support, strategy support, and um, organizing support across all of those. And ultimately when Bracken left and we decided to make Apollo into its own 501c3, I became a director of Apollo after Bracken, and then I followed Bracken to Center for American Progress. So I just followed Bracken around, basically, <laughs> was what I did. Um, Not anymore. <laughs> um, it's always a good idea. I recommend it. Um, but I feel like it was a really, and it continues to be, I mean, it, what we realized with Apollo was that there were all of these incredibly important lessons that we've had for decades about how to think about economic development and do asset mapping and figure out where the strengths of a place are, very place-based building, and a workforce development history that's been very good, that we can learn a lot from, and a lot of experience doing organizing on the ground and place-based work, and we sort of brought that to this conversation that had been extremely top-down, um, I think, until that point, and kind of global and top-down, and we sort of brought this bottom-up idea around it that was very economic in nature, and I think that it has been hugely influential, actually. Um, so what I'm doing now is I am uh, Governor Gavin Newsom, California's senior climate advisor, and I run a think tank within the government under the governor's office called the Office of Planning and Research, and we do long-range planning for the state of California. So now I get to do all this stuff in the fifth biggest economy in the world, so it's pretty fun. Cool. <laughs> okay, great. So now, so first of all, I have this list of questions that I'm just really sadly not remotely going to be able to get through. Um, but um, so I'm going to start sort of combining and ad living here a little bit, which may go well or not. Um, <laughs> so, uh, uh, but, so uh, but actually, I want to, because like one of the things we always try to do here is like actually ask ourselves some hard questions. So I'm going to ask some hard questions. Um, so, uh, um, you know, uh, lots of ways in which we had a lot of impact. You know, politically, that frame we created was really powerful. Um, and I want to go back, um, you know, to kind of like really one of the one of the sort of originary uh, kind of experiences as we started to kind of try to figure this thing out. And and Brack and you were actually there. Uh, you know, we went and we went to uh, Erie, Pennsylvania, uh, and we did. This would have been 2002, maybe early 2003. I can't remember exactly uh, when we did those focus groups. And I, I at the time was a pollster, and I did all the original, the sort of first focus groups and polling on this concept. And, and as, as Dan and, and I think Kate, you know, we kind of started out as right after 9-11, and we're like, this is about like getting off of oil and, and energy security. Um, and uh, so we go in and we go do this focus group, and um, uh, it just becomes really, really clear that um, the economic kind of the sort of jobs in this new clean energy economy we're going to go build was really the thing that, you know, for, for at least in a place like Erie, Pennsylvania, this sort of swing state, working class, um, you know, I, I, I think we did, uh, you know, we did sort of, I think we started with like sort of what we called, used to call Reagan Democrats then, uh, so working class white men. Um, and I, I remember we have this conversation, they keep coming back to like, so this means like we'll kind of like open some factories, you know, we'll get some factories here, we'll make the solar panels, we'll make the wind turbines. Um, and, and I remember, because it was very poignant, um, you know, I, when I would run moderate, and I was moderating this group, and when I would moderate these groups, after, um, uh, you know, kind of get to a point towards the end where I would leave the room. Um, you know, in part to go back and just ask people on the other side of the glass if there's things that they had seen that they wanted me to ask about, but the thing that was always most interesting is that it's like, it's like they know that you're behind the glass, but they just forget. They start talking to each other. And it was always, like, often the most interesting thing that would happen in any focus group was what the people talked about um, when you weren't in the room, uh, when there's no one in the room. And, and they started speculating about, like, you know, um, is this like a big manufacturer that wants to come uh, build, like, a wind turbine factory in Erie? And they, they kept talking and they kept getting so excited about this idea that like this new industry would come. 
Um, and that was like the aha moment, right? We're like, Jesus, you know, like, like this is the key to kind of reaching these constituencies. Um, and we went and did a follow-up poll, and the numbers were kind of like off the charts in terms of like never, you know, no one had sort of seen numbers, especially from that kind of constituency on any kind of sort of thing that was ostensibly an environmental thing before. Um, and we went and like the steel work, we showed it to like the United Steelworkers and the Steelworkers didn't believe us, so they re-ran the poll with their own pollster and got the same results. Um, so like, like and, and I actually wrote about this uh, after Trump's election, um, uh, you know, sort of thinking about sort of what that meant. And, and you know, um, so Trump, of course, you know, like just, just you know, De Erie, which was once this sort of union democratic stronghold, Trump just sort of, sort of ran, you know, ran up a huge majority there. Um, and, you know, uh, for all the sort of things we accomplished, you know, um, uh, you know, at least what these guys heard was that we were going to bring jobs and manufacturing back to Erie, and we didn't. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I'd like to kind of get, you know, uh, you know, we talked a little bit on this on the call we did beforehand, but like, 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 um, what, what, why didn't, you know, why didn't we get, uh, you know, why didn't manufacture, you know, what part of this vision didn't actually work, or, or did we oversell parts of it, um, uh, you know, because, because, like, obviously there's a set of constituencies there that um, uh, uh, we didn't actually deliver for. Um, whoever wants to start there. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm happy to, or Kate, you would go the other way this yeah, time, sorry. I don't care. I mean, I think, look, you've got, and I'm going to try to combine some of the thinking just in terms of, you know, lessons learned and things we screwed up and things that may move forward. I mean, there's definitely something there. I mean, whether it's Apollo, Manhattan Project, Green New Deal, big vision, let's go that way. It, it is a engaging vision and it's almost like a converging limit in calculus. You may never get there, but you want to get closer over time. And it's a good thing. And if you just get into a debate about is your plan three million new jobs, which was what we put out, and uh, they were defensible numbers given the spend we were talking about, or this plan, I think you, you lose a lot. I think the storytelling piece, I think, is one key. I mean, when, you know, at the time, the other thing that was going on, the debate about Arctic drilling was sort of the endless conversation between enviros and rubbing with labor around this. And when we could show there were manly man steel jobs in Pennsylvania and other places, I think people, leaned in, the hard work of actually making successful stories happen and public-private partnership and not race to the bottom, tax stuff, I mean, these are problems that, and permitting and regulation, et cetera, I mean, this is stuff that I think we all work in, in in one way or another in our job. I mean, at our heyday, we had Gamisa Wind, which was the right. old Johnstown steel uh, facility that reopened, it was now making, you know, Win, win stuff, which was great. Um, so I think we had some of that going with the Apollo Service Center, the idea of going local with states. I mean, I think one of my big, and you know, I joke, I've got two uh, millennial kids, so they talk about, you know, when I talk boomsplaining, uh, you know, so opportunity to boomsplain about stuff to Green New Deal. But I do think whatever that can happen nationally and inspire people is great, but how do we implement this? How do you go local? You know, where we, I think, made a smart move was getting labor, which was the dominant no on board uh, with this. But I think if you work in communities now, it's, it's my sense that it is local community activists, environmental justice, folks that are outside the economic mainstream want something to happen. They're now the number one no to stop things, and I credit them. But how do we get them to the table? How do we get impact capital to the table? I mean, we have blue and green labor and environment, but whatever color community leaders and EJ leaders are, whatever color uh, green's already taken for impact capital, mm -hmm. I do think the local effort of how do we create these stories and talk about them is critical. I mean, they're very good, the other side, if you will, you know, $93 trillion economic study, you know, poor Ed Markey, good man, you know, tweeted out, you know, this is, will be 10% of whatever obscure climate study that will be the cost of it by 2100. We need to tell in these local stories, but we also need to get in the weeds of, of building them, I think is, is a key point. So 
there's a couple there's a couple pieces to this. First, there's a rhetorical and a message framing and a narrative question. <clears throat> and I think we showed pretty successfully that talking about jobs and talking about the economy matters a lot. Um, and, and I think we did it from a place of tremendous sincerity. Um, I, I believe that. <clears throat> and um, it was actually easier to get the, the labor movement on board than it was to get the full endorsement of the green community, which was surprising. Uh, the green community was very much arrayed against uh, mercury and air toxics at the time. And that really starting a conversation about green jobs and jo investment in the clean economy was, it, it's hard to go back and realize that that was actually very threatening. Um, so we, we succeeded in having that conversation. Um, I, having, I, 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 I don't think we failed. I don't think we have done it yet. Uh, this is a huge economic transition that we are on the cusp of. We really do need to rebuild massive amounts of infrastructure, rebuild our manufacturing base, rebuild the competitiveness of domestic industries. And this is, I mean, it is about infrastructure, construction, and manufacturing jobs. And I think that still remains absolutely true. Um, jumping forward to the, uh, a little bit to the Recovery Act, the $90 billion that were in there uh, that were very specifically for green, for weatherizing homes, building battery manufacturing for electric cars, a whole set of things, were actually highly successful and, and really did perform. Um, but it's not at the scale of the current challenge. Um, what we were talking about with the Inslee campaign, we were very focused on two things, on setting strong rules and standards, and then backing it up with public investment to leverage private investment. And we really are talking about massive shifts of capital, and, and those things are transformative and they're job creating. I mean, you, you talk off, oh, often about fracking, right? Fracking is in the fossil fuel industry, but it's a new technology that unlocked a hell of a lot of investment. If you look at the digital economy and what happened when we moved to an entirely digitized cloud-based economy, these things cascade through. We're gonna be driving a lot of efficiencies uh, across the entire economy if we do this and do this right. Um, I think it's unfair though to judge this as if it was a, uh, a political gimmick. Uh, what this is, is actually the next major wave of economic transformation, uh, and it's really just gaining momentum at this time. W one last thing and to, yeah, hand of to Kate. This notion of standards and investment, the place where it's happening is in cities and states and green building laws and renewable energy policies. A whole set of things about infrastructure are unfolding and so I look forward to my state colleague. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, I, I think you're, this point is a really interesting one that Bragan just said about how it wasn't gimmicky. I mean, I have said before many times and I will say again that I think one of the big, one of the big challenges we had was that we came to the jobs argument as an economic development. It was, it was an economic development what is, argument. It wasn't a jobs argument. We were always about what are the underlying structures that you need to do? What are, the, what are the community level partnerships you need to build? What are the workforce strategies you need? What are the ways to embed this stuff in codes and standards? And in um, how we do, you know, we did like community benefits agreements. Um, we did best value contracting memos. Like we were all about embedding this structural stuff into policy as, and then coming out of all of that, the theory was, and I still believe, you come up with a lot of really good jobs that are actually both high quality and they're creating, you know, a more sustainable economy. You know, we call that, we called that and still call that high road jobs, right, that combine kind of taking the high road, you're both sustainable from an economic perspective and sustainable from an environmental perspective. I do think that the, that the number, what happened to some extent was that the, the, the number, the three million job number became a gimmick for a lot of people who were not doing the underlying um, organizational strategy. So you started to see every single environmental organization start throwing job numbers into every single report that they did. And this whole idea of what a green job was became this sort of like, well, how many apples to, you know, apples to oranges comparisons? Are you gonna build the Keystone Pipeline? How many jobs does that create versus how many jobs does it create over here? How many jobs do you create if you do fracking or if you ban fracking? I mean, these, these, these essentially impossible comparisons because at the end of the day, I was just saying to Adele Morris over there, 
we're talking about moving from a, an extractive economy that creates very specific place-based jobs, extracting something that never stops being extracted, and then pr processing it and refining it and moving it around and using it, it's a pretty labor-intensive thing to do. To an economy that's based on something, wind and solar in particular, that you don't have to extract, that's one of the beauties of those things, that's why they're cheaper. So it's very, very hard to do an apples to apples comparison of those two things. You have to talk about it in terms of what kind of economy are we creating? What kinds of jobs, what kinds of infrastructure, what kinds of benefits? And ultimately, I think that's where we have to get back to. And I'm sort of, I think that's the good, a good thing in some ways about the Green New Deal framing is that it gets back to this as an economic initiative and not as sort of a environmental initiative with a bunch of co-benefits of creating jobs. Uh, which I think is just is, is really important. And part of why it's so important, and it goes to your original question, which I will get back to, which is, yeah, we didn't create a whole bunch of manufacturing. One of the challenging things about this, if you think in terms of green jobs or like a one-to-one -one replacement, is that those jobs are no less subject to automation and globalization pressures as any other kind of jobs, right? It's not like you <laughs> magically don't have automation because you're building a wind turbine, right? You still have the same economic impacts that you or have. Or that you can't, or, the, or that like China might actually turn out to do Or turn out to do it at scale, right? I mean, there's, there's any number of turbines things. than we are. So I think getting back to this idea of embedding this structurally into our policies is incredibly important. And you know, very short commercial for California, it is what we're trying to do. California just put in, a high road training partnership section into our budget under our cap and trade program to build these exact kind of local sort of intermediary partnerships to talk about what this looks like in different regions of the state. We're grappling with an oil and gas sector that provide that is 100% providing stuff to us. They don't export at all. We 25 we 25 of the oil and gas we use in California we produce. So we're grappling with that as a sector. We're trying to think through the fact that most of the jobs we've created in our cap and trade program investments are construction jobs. So we're creating a con high road construction career letters program that actually does pre-apprenticeships and apprenticeships. So into not just solar installation, but into multi-craft construction. So that if I am in that industry, I could be putting up solar panels one week, but if like there's a policy change or there's a saturation, frankly, in putting up solar panels, I can do something else. I can be an electrician on like a so th th this is a really, okay. I want to, I wanna, <laughs> there's an interesting segue here that I want to get at because, I, and I think you kind of allude to it a little bit, um, which is really interesting, like, I, I think one of the interesting contrasts between this sort of Apollo kind of economic argument and at least sort of the original construction of the Green New Deal um, is that, um, you know, the sort of Apollo argument really sort of situated most of the economic benefits in the energy transition itself. It kind of... Uh, it literally, it, it said, we're going to, um, you know, kind of do this energy transition and we're going to create all these jobs with the solar manufacturing and the home retrofitting and all the other things. That's where the actual, the jobs and the economic development and benefits going to come from. And I, I think what's kind of interesting, you know, and controversial also, um, and we're hearing in some ways kind of less about it, which I want to come back to, but like in the kind of at least the original Green New Deal, right, it was like, a new deal that was going to be kind of green. It was going to have green stuff in it, but it was also going to do like Medicare for all and a federal jobs guarantee. And what's interesting is that a lot of the sort of social and economic benefits were actually outside of the energy transition itself in that, in that kind of particular, which is quite different than sort of the way that we sort of conceptualized Apollo and then certainly the way that it was sort of sold where it was like, you know, pass the cap and trade bill to create three million new jobs. It's like. You know, uh, that dog didn't hunt very well. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm interested in, in kind of what, you know, is that smart? Is it not smart? Is it sort of like, does that make sense to you, you know, sort of looking back or, or not? Because it's a quite different in that sense, I think. Let me jump in. First of all, I think the Green New Deal is quite exciting. Um, and I think it is an extension of a lot of the thinking we were doing. And I, that high-level framework of talking about reconstruction and reinvestment in the infrastructure of the economy, the notion of what happens and what may be possible in a wartime level of mobilization. I know that's metaphoric and it's, it's inexact. Um, but the idea that this is about building things and transforming the way we build our productive base is very important. Um, what we tried to do 
in the Inslee planning team was to really think about if we're really serious with something that is at the level of where we are in terms of the health of the ecosystem and the scientific mandates that are there, what has to be done and how could we do it credibly but with a level of ambition to actually do it. And it was about toggling you know, standards and investment and accomplishing certain things on penetration in buildings, in cars, in agriculture and forestry, in all of the pieces that kind of come together to change how we produce things to make it regenerative instead of extractive. Um, but you do touch many of these social policy pieces. I think the, the high level framing of Medicare for all and full, full employment is it's a crude way of looking at what is involved in this work. Um, uh, crude just in terms of it's a very simple and high level way in a very in in an early stage framing piece in the in the Inslee plan one of the pieces that I was most proud of we called a GI bill for energy workers and it was really looking at the issue of economic dislocation if you really probe what is keeping mine workers up at night it's the fact that they are coal mining companies are declaring bankruptcy right and left under Trump and a, and a Republican-led Congress that claims to be pro-coal. They are declaring bankruptcy so they can shed their pension and health care obligations for, for sick mine workers uh, suffering from long-term chronic and deadly illnesses and their dependent uh, spouses and children. So if you take that pension obligation out of contention. And then if you look at an economic development strategy for these rural communities that are sitting on a wealth of infrastructure and you're serious about it, and you look at educational and training and, and health benefits and all of these pieces, how they come together, you could create an entirely diff different political reality. And to me, that's where this conversation needs to go. It's about what do working people encounter during times of transition. If you look at Germany, I mean, there's a lot to critique about the German transition. But when they moved away from direct domestic coal mining, um, the transition and the, and the actual care of mining communities and the actual miners was a very, very stable social safety net. And they had a very different political debate around that piece of it. Um, so, so to me, the Green New Deal in its original incarnation was, was articulating an agenda. And, and I would say absolutely, you know, health, pension security, economic security, and how we grow the economy is a part of it. Uh, is it the complete articulation? I don't think it is, but. Hmm. Interesting. I, and I guess I, you know, your original question, I mean, once you break up the piece, and is it this piece or this piece? I mean, I think both Apollo, Manhattan Project, Green New Deal, people are looking for a unified vision, and it's at some level, as a political strategist or a former political strategist, you know, what, if people, it's like a Rorschach ink plot. If people see it's in there, great. The way this works is, you know, what can move what's ripe in three, five year chunks? Um, we didn't see natural gas coming. Something may happen with storage or other stuff will be going. So I think, I think about the challenges of the next generation that are working on this stuff. I mean, I remember, you know, went to the Obama campaign on purpose to try to one last push to, Juice the money through on the you know Apollo investment vision. I remember, you know, got it, uh, the basic uh, same pair got to be tested both in the national security poll and the domestic poll. And I remember when Axelrod turned to me and said, "Carol, relax. Yes, it's number one in both. I mean, it's it has all of these things. But I think that the challenge will be, you know, if this can become uh, not." defined as a $93 trillion this plan mess, uh, but instead a bunch of local stories where Ted Nordhaus, you know, Green New Deal Milwaukee, who created, created 15 jobs as an applause line, or at least a defensive line, so that we can have a legislative conversation and move some money in 2021, then that becomes, all right, what can you get at that point? And that's, you know, I'm setting up my own question because I want to make this point. I mean, when, in we got Obama elected and we had this new energy thing moving, but you know, there reached a point with Tea Party and Copenhagen and Capitre that wasn't gonna go anywhere. We could add a national RES, no problem with Republicans and a $3 oil price floor. So to me, I think one of the challenges for the Green New Deal, it's a great engaging idea. There are great versions of it. 
Bracken's new, new policy consensus, others, we love them all, but when push comes to shove, like, is it all gonna happen in 2021 or will it be in 2023? I think the flexibility of what's ripe and being able to jump on that and maybe it'll be a national security argument or an economic argument, I think that's the beauty of this vehicle. So, so I wanna, I wanna um, uh, kind of another sort of uh, segue here, but you know, I, and, and you guys may disagree with me and I, I'll be interested, um, but one of the things that really um, uh, I felt, you know, that you know, when, when sort of Green New Deal, like it kind of, you know, what, a year ago or so, where it really kind of suddenly, it's a big thing, everyone's, and it was like this kind of like, you know, it was like a new deal, right? We're gonna get a new deal, we're gonna kind of go kind of rebuild things like FDR did, but you know, for 21st century, and we're gonna deal with all these new problems we have. Um, it, and, and you know, climate was sort of a big part of it, but it wasn't only climate. And I, I'm, I'm kind of really struck that it seems like it's just only climate and it's, you know, I mean, if you kind of look, you know, Apollo obviously had a kind of climate uh, kind of edge to it, but it also was like, no, this is actually a vision for a better economy and a better future, and this is what it looks like. And sort of, I felt like Green New Deal sort of had that, and then it kind of lost it. It just kind of got overtaken by the kind of apocalyptic sort of climate emergency, 12 years, all of that stuff. I, I, I wonder what you guys, you know, agree or disagree or... or or what your perception of, you know, is that a liability? Is it, a, is it a, um, uh, an asset? Um, well, in some ways it's the same. I mean, I'm not sure it's totally true, but to the extent that that's true, I think it's sort of the same thing I was talking about earlier that sort of happened to Apollo. I mean, one of the things that I think is a big challenge in the climate movement and fight against every day, frankly, is that it's still seen as an environmental movement and not an economic movement. And to some extent, what we're actually talking about is climate change is a macroeconomic trend affecting every sector and every part of the world, not in that different of a way than we think of other huge trends like inequality and automation and things that are very big and sort of, they differ, they're different in different sectors, but they're, they're, they're that broad, it's that broad and that impactful. And I sort of think that that's, it's a mistake to move back away from that and get back into very familiar lanes of you know, counting carbon emissions and figuring out what's gonna happen in the next conference of the parties for the UN. And you know, th these things that we talk about and bringing back the same policy things and hoping that it's a moment to have them happen again because we have a new frame. You know, ultimately, I do think that we have to get to a place where this is, again, embedded throughout our conversations about what kind of economy we want. This, climate change is ultimately about inequality and about automation and about globalization and about how we build things and about, frankly, just shifts across the entire world. I don't know, World Economic Forum recently did a, their global risks report last year. The top like five global risks that they identified are mostly in the environmental space, but they're mostly about things like migration from climate impacts and impacts on crops and crop security and how that's affecting different you know, uh, political dynamics and about, um, movement, uh, you know, because of things like extreme heat and flooding of entire industries from one place to another. I mean, that is not an environmental issue only. At the end of the day, it really is an economic issue. So I just worry whenever we stop talking about it that way because it starts to narrow again into very old, tried and true factions. And I just don't think it's, we're not gonna win on this stuff if it becomes just that point again. The, the question of urgency and opportunity is a, it's an inherent tension, and I think it's actually very useful to straddle the tension and to think about how to use it strategically. Um, I think if there was an excess and a weakness on the Apollo, it's that it became too much about the excitement of the opportunity right. without the urgency of the mandate. Right, and I think it became easier to attack it as light or aspirational or ungrounded. I think if you actually, and, and frankly, we're you know, 10, 15 years on. Although most of, those, most of that came from like the environmental community. But, but um. well, well, I think there was a fear of, of, yeah. uh, of leaning into the crisis of the climate uh, situation. And I think the embrace of the climate crisis and you know, Greta Thunberg and you know, God bless her, but um, you know, 
the world is in a fairly precarious state. The migration, the yep. stress, the, you know, why are there climate refugees on our southern, southern border? It has a right. lot to do with rainfall patterns in Guatemala right now and what's happening to the coffee crops. I mean, these things are real and they create other friction that we don't identify as environmental. Um, and I think it's useful to, to take the energy and the urgency of that, but then to have a way forward and to say, here's where we're going. And, and that's, I mean, to me, looking back at American history, you know, not as a rhetorical device, but like the New Deal actually is a moment, how you respond to the crisis of, of rising fascism or, uh, or environmental collapse from a dust bowl or a massive depression that, that causes uh, capital markets to collapse. You can take really bad things and rise to the challenge, and that gets back to Dan and the original aspirational message when faced with attack you know, do we call on our higher angels and do we find a way through and do we dig deep on the best traditions of, a, of you know, what makes America kind of unique in its ability to build stuff and invent new systems and do it by bringing people together uh, in an inclusive manner to create more uh, broadly shared prosperity and the existence of the middle class. I mean, this is yet another moment and we're either gonna do it or we're not and you know, for me, I wanna, I want to ride the urgency, but, but not stop there. Uh, I think that's a tr tremendous mistake if it's mm. just catastrophism. This, this may shock you, Ted, but I, I'm going to agree with you. Um, the, I am very worried about, um, you know, we have seen this movie before where the communications presuppositions of the mainstream environmental movement that climate has to be a moral issue or this has to be a crisis or whatever it is, all of which are correct in the urgency thing. But I look at this as, you know, A, what's the price of failing politically? If you look at Copenhagen or other examples, do we measure, as we think about 12-year urgency, do we measure the cost of failure politically at, in terms of time, and all of that stuff, because if, you, if we don't have the political power to execute on whatever aspect of a plan you think is the right plan, you have to be very, very careful with that. And so, you know, if I had one slide I would put up here, I'd sometimes do a talk, it's sort of an outcomes curve. I mean, we're in this moment now of disrupted politics and fractured and broken permitting, as our old Apollo friend Tom Matsu is in the solar business, and regulatory challenges where deployment, and I'm on team deployment rather than breakthrough technology guy, let's deploy what we have, let's get in the weeds and deploy what we have, it's pretty good. Like we're in this stuck, terrible, frustrating area where people feel urgent, but if you, you know, Icarus to the sun with a proposal that's not gonna get there, you lose a lot of time. I think we have to believe in this longer term outcomes thing and sometimes Good climate outcomes, I think resilience is a magic word right now to get a lot of business done. And to save money, if you think adaptation and accepting adaptation is a moral hazard, we will save lots of money for mitigation. So that's my argument for it. <laughs> All right, so, because uh, this is a breakthrough uh, event, one last question I have to ask. Um, we talked about this a little bit uh, in our pre-call too. And Bracken reminded me, uh, you know, I was like, I don't really, we didn't really talk much about nuclear or carbon capture. And Bracken was like, Bracken said, oh, no, it was in there. <laughs> um, um, so, um, you know, obviously this is kind of a, a big debate in the Green, you know, with the Green New Deal right now, um, you know, both around sort of the role uh, that nuclear might play and also uh, sort of carbon capture uh, and some of these um, less sort of pretty picturesque uh, technologies, uh, although Susie Baker's going to change that. Um, um, but... Um, uh, you know, what do you, you know, give us, you know, do we need, you know, can we just do it all with 100% renewables? Do we need to actually uh, hedge our bets here? Um, I mean, we did talk about, we were actually, uh, just to dispute the premise, yeah. we were actually there on CCS, before, unlike most people. I mean, I, we were uh, involved in the project of trying to figure out carbon capture and storage on industrial plants because we had a big industrial agenda. I mean, we were really... I will say, you know, it's the dirty secret of the coal clean economy is you have to build a whole bunch of stuff using a whole bunch of manufacturing. And there's, you know, 80% of every turbine is steel, right? So we were very interested in that question of how do you not have an additive 
thing here from a pollution or carbon perspective. And we did a lot of early work with the Clean Air um, Task Force and others on that question. And frankly, I think some of the earliest work that's now, thanks to Jane Flagel, who's here, and others ramping up around carbon removal more generally, and how do you start thinking about sort of the land sector, and how does that play a role? So, so it was, I mean, if there's one thing I'll say about Apollo that I think was really important, and I try to hold on to with, to with all the work that I still do, is it was very reality-based. We were like, what does that world actually look like? What are people actually doing? What are the actual outcomes of these things? And then how do we deal with that? We had implementation strategies. And I don't think you can, you cannot credibly talk about climate change without having a carbon removal implementation strategy, is my view. I'll well, let them talk about nuclear. Um, <laughs> definitely on the carbon removal. I'm you know, hopeful that there could be some really good breakthroughs on storage and you know, the deforestation and all the tree, you know, things as tried as tree planting and fixing rivers and fixing hillsides that could put a lot of people to work, I think have a lot of potential on the mobilization stuff. On nuclear, you know, I, I guess I would say this, the, there's this Price-Anderson Act from 1952, which basically gives the nuclear industry, the taxpayers will pay for an accident, um, which made sense to start it at the time. You know, I think if we're heading towards a Jigger Shaw subsidy free environment where we take away oil and gas subsidies and we've gotten solar and other things to um, reach parity. It's a really big subsidy. So to me, if, if the nuclear industry, small or big, wanted to repeal it, I, I, would, I would have a totally different view about it than I do right now, which I just think is a deployment question compared to other things given the political opposition. You know, that, that's my dance on nuclear. So, uh, on carbon capture, industry is, if you go through all of the various sectors and wedges, when you get to industry, it is a very hard and expensive wedge. Um, and I think CCS especially makes sense there in a way that's maybe different from continuing coal-fired power plants. And so I think having a kind of a discerning approach about how expensive is it, how difficult is it, and where is it most appropriately utilized I think it gets you to an answer that is kind of reality-based, and if we don't have solid strategies for... And if we can't keep oil on the ground, it's plan B. So, <laughs> so, 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 that, so that's a key piece. On nuclear, I mean, I kind of get to a similar place where I think early retirement of existing nuclear creates a hole in a zero carbon, and so that, that kind of makes, that makes me nervous, right, to think about... A, a, a sort of an ideological anti-nuclear approach that is causing you to wind down a, a, a wedge that is producing zero carbon energy now. I think that there is potentially a new generation of small modular, cheaper, safer plants and modeled after what they're doing in France that could be practical, but I think there's more R&D there. And so having an R&D agenda that looks at anything that may be useful in the arsenal is highly practical. And then when you get to where are we going to get the preponderance of our zero carbon electricity now as, a, as an engineering challenge, I'm a lot more excited about greater grid connectivity, more infusions of storage, firming up wind with wind in different wind sheds and solar. I think there's a huge amount we haven't even touched um, about deploying existing renewables and let alone you know, massive in, increases in energy efficiency in buildings, which is hard to get, not because of technology, but because of, you know, habit and markets and uh, behavior. So I, I think it's a little bit false to go too deep into the, the volatile technologies. Um, I'd rather not get polarized about it. I think there's a lot of work to do now on deployment, uh, and the stuff, the tools that we have are quite powerful. Um, Jay Inslee often would talk about, I don't want to write love letters to 2050. I want to think about what we're going to do today and tomorrow. Um, and I think whoever is president, whoever's in Congress, the most important thing right now is, do we prioritize this challenge as the top issue or not? And, and I think that's what we all have to come to with our toolkit.